So hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein, as always. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm really excited to tell you about my next guest. She is truly one of a kind. Her name is Annika Pavel. You may be familiar with that name, and you'll hear why in a moment. So Annika was born Jarmila Kochvarova in Czechoslovakia. What was intended as a one-year stay in England turned her into a refugee when the Soviet Union invaded her homeland. And this wrote a bloody end to the Prague Spring. So Annika received a crash course in life that took her from sleeping in a telephone booth, if you can believe it, at the Victoria Railway Station in London, to waitressing, to the lights of the fashion runway, and onto magazine covers, and even a James Bond appearance. Under the more pronounceable moniker, Annika Pavel, when the lights had dimmed, she returned to her first love, which is writing. Her work has been published in print, online, and it's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. So, Annika, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to meet you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> you have such an incredible story. Um, and I had a chance to begin your book. I have not yet finished it. but. You really write with such genuineness, and you really take the reader very quickly into your journey. I, I almost felt like I was there as you were describing everything you had experienced, and that's not easy to do. Um, so it's a really compelling work. I'm very interested to hear you share more about your journey from Czechoslovakia um, to becoming a model, an actress, a writer, somebody with international cachet. So tell us more. Well, it's, you know, it, it was a career that wasn't particularly designed. I didn't come to England to be a model. I came to learn to speak English, and I was hoping to be a journalist. But um, when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, that all came all unglued, and I, as time went by, I realized that really, the longer I stayed in England, um, because they didn't shut the door instantly, and so I stayed for two years, during which time I did become a model. I won a competition to be a model, which was kind of more accidental. And um, so by the time they closed the door on us and ordered everyone to come back, I, it was a dubious what my future would have been like. Um, anyone could have just called me a traitor or, you know, working for, for the British, and that would land me in prison. And it's, people did a lot of things to climb on somebody else's shoulders. This has been, and I grew up with it when, you know, when the Russians and first after the, the war, how they used to have this show trials and my father would listen to it and it, it stayed with me forever and um, I was afraid of it and so I have um, decided to stay in England and uh, you know it kind of evolved from there there were a number of um, number of problems that I had to deal with but you know when you are young the world is your oyster and um, I never really thought about possibility of failing. I just believed that I would be perfectly fine and I will do it. And I just worked hard. Sometimes I had three jobs, but ultimately I had a goal and I knew that I will succeed. Can you really, as a very young woman, you were dealing with quite a lot of stress and uncertainty, concern about your family. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more. I like that, you know, you, you bring awareness to the refugee experience, the immigrant experience. We'll get more into that a little bit. But, you know, as a young girl, here you were in a completely different country without, you know, familiar family and friends and Everything, everything was different. 
having to learn a new language very quickly. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what that was like. Well, I was busy. I had to learn a language. And I find myself being completely alone um, because I did not know anybody. I just, I was in England only a few months, um, six, seven months when the Russians invaded Soviets, Russians, what's the difference? When they invaded Czechoslovakia. And um, and that's why I love that it's happening again. I know how it feels to all those refugees that are pouring out. And uh, when when it, when you when you are afraid to go home, and um, so I I had to deal with what I had to deal with head on because there was no one to turn to, and um, I was lucky with a lot of people who were helpful um, that gave me jobs. Even my English wasn't quite good enough, but they thought, "Don't worry, you'll learn," and I did. And um, it's it's sometimes hard for me to go back and think about it, um, because when you when you are in the middle of it, you just kind of deal with it. And it's sometimes when I was writing the book, sometimes I would burst to tears, and I thought to myself, "How did I ever not cry when it was happening?" And I think it's because at the time, you don't have the luxury of crying. You don't have the luxury of of giving up. You just have to put your right foot in front of your left and keep going. So You were in survival mode. Right. Right. And it's kind of amazing what people, I'm always amazed at what people do in the heat of the moment when they must to survive. But I'm not surprised that actually, as you were revisiting these memories and writing them down for your book, that it activated so much emotion. Yes. And it is hard to sit with that. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, and I, my mother was at the time ill. And, um, and that was also a responsibility I had to take on. And I've, but I felt fortunate that eventually I was able to supply the medication that was not available in Czechoslovakia. And um, and she lived a lot longer than she would have done if she didn't have that medication. And that made me feel good and kept, kept me going. You had so much on your shoulders, though, as a, you know, a young person, as a teenager. And I think that's hard for, you know, a, a lot of people today to wrap their minds around. And we, we can talk more about that in a moment, because you alluded to, again, your compassion right now for people who are suffering under similar circumstances. Right. Right. It, it's very important in in so many ways when people are unable to put themselves in a in a shoes of those who are suffering, and um, not everybody succeed. I had an uncle in my family, my my that I write about my mother's uncle who left as a young eighteen year old boy to go to to America and uh, he ended up in Pennsylvania and he worked in mines and he contracted tuberculosis. He never made enough money to come back and and died quite young really. And um so it's it's not always a winning streak. I was very fortunate um and that's why I feel that compassion for those who are not in the same place, it's important. 100%. I think we're, not everybody, but I think a lot of people here are experiencing a, a crisis level lack of empathy. And it's one of the things that's really hard to sit with because you're right, if we can step in the shoes of another person, what that would do to make the world better, I can't even fully comprehend. Exactly. So important. And I think your book is going to be, you know, so important for people who read it 
Right. Not only people who would already be sympathetic, but for people who are uh, will allow themselves to open their minds and and step into your experience and into the stories that you share. Right. Um, I know that you talk about your childhood under Iron Curtain influence. This has been very influential for you. It's influenced how you look at the world. I know we touched on that a little bit. It's been influenced, influential in terms of the career choices you've made. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's my father was a tailor, and so I was always around clothes. Um, but as a child in Czechoslovakia, there were very few choices, but we did have an ability to to have a sport. And I was lucky. I was influenced by sport a lot. I was a swimmer, not a very good one, but I had a coach who always believed it doesn't matter how far behind you get, as long as you get there. And somehow it actually guided me a lot because you don't win every single race and you can't and you don't judge yourself by not succeeding. And then later when I was a model, I went to maybe out of every 25 auditions, I got one. That doesn't mean that you do, you, you didn't do well. It's just somebody else was faster than me. And giving up is not an option. And it was, it was a very good lesson that I have learned. And I had also a very influential mother who always believed that books are answer to everything and travel has to be what, what is important, what brings us closer to the books. When you cannot travel, you learn about other nations. She didn't buy novels necessarily. What we used to get, we used to get books about travel. And in a country where you couldn't travel yourself, there was there was there were books that would be about different countries and about there was a particular couple, um two two young men who were allowed to travel and then do books about Africa. And I remember my mother would hungrily buy every new book and we used to have them and I used to go over and over and over those pages of those photographs and I kind of felt like I have been to Africa um, because of those books. And so ultimately she was right. The, the, the books brings us closer. And um, so that was a bit, another very big influence. And so to learn about others, it's, it was so pivotal for me. Um, that, that teaches you, once you learn about somebody, you can understand their point of view, even if it's not a point of view you agree with. And, you know, that's that's how it was. I mean, a lot of people in England were very kind. You know, they did not judge me because I was from a from a communist country. They judged me for who I was, and that was very fortunate. You're making me think of a few things. Um, from the beginning of your book, this may be early in the interview to ask you about this, but you you talk about living in this basically rooming house. Yes. Yes. And working there as an au pair, but really there are no children. You are cooking and cleaning for the adults who are rooming there and Mrs. Landis. Right. Um, and I think the reason why I'm thinking about this is because, again, you're talking about empathy and you're talking about seeing different points of view and you're talking about whether or not you take the other person's point of view isn't even really the point. Because I'm, you know, right in the beginning, you very, um, you very vividly illustrate thoughtfully but I could see in my mind, I could imagine you as a young girl in this rooming house where Mrs. Landis, who was a nurse and is a holistic health practitioner, has a lot of young girls who are coming to stay and, you know, ostensibly for dermatology appointments. And it turns out that you find out that Mrs. Landis is performing abortions for young women who could, for a variety of reasons, could not have 
it would not have been in their best interest to carry these pregnancies to term for a variety of right. social, political, economic, and, and was- other reasons. And you're very honest about how you felt shock when you found this out. You felt guilt and you felt compassion. All of these things. You wrestled, it sounds like, with you know, your own thoughts about what Mrs. Landis was doing and also your compassion and understanding for what she was doing and what those women needed. Um, yes. And that's a complicated set of things for a young girl to sit with. Yes. And you did. Yes. And there's so much we could learn from that on a grander scale about being willing to look at things through other people's eyes and experiences. Right. Yes. Yes, I think it taught me to, you know, although at the, at the, at the beginning I was obviously surprised, shocked, and did not understand. Um, after all, I was only 18. Um, but as time went by more and more, um, I began to understand. Um, and especially knowing that I myself, um, you know, I write at the end when it really sat with me when I realized, what would I do? I had nobody. Everyone was leaning on me. And some of those girls, at least one or two I knew, were in a similar condition. Um, you know, it's it's easy to judge, but it's much harder to to help. And that's why I decided to always try to help. And I was glad I did, as feeble as my help was. Um, and that's why, ultimately, um, I have been so thankful that I was not just that I, I came to, it's kind of almost like, I sometimes think it's a destiny, if anyone does believe it or not, that I ended up not taking care of the children, but I ended up with somebody who was very deep and complicated, but very kind and who enriched my life so much. And we stayed in touch um, until her death. And um, and I feel that I was extremely fortunate and lucky um, it's serendipity that I ended up being in that place instead of anywhere else. And um, and I was always surrounded. My grandmother was um, a very forward-thinking person and different. And um, And I think that I always moved in those circles. It's almost like I was in, in a wave of life where these things happened for a reason. They happen because it's almost like somebody decided not only will you survive it, you will also be enriched and you'll be better for it. And and I feel I am. So I'm grateful for that. Beautifully said. And, and you very thoughtfully handle these complex topics in it also a very real and genuine way. I wanted you to know that I appreciated that when I was reading that. Thank you. Um, You know, you've alluded to your motivation for writing this book. I'm sure it's even bigger than that. Um, You know, usually a last question I would ask is what you hope readers take from it. But I think from our conversation, they're already getting a sense that there is so much to take from it. Yes. um, You know, I never felt that I wanted to write biography or anything like that. I didn't think of myself as as, um, somebody anyone would want to know about. And so I started to write short story because I loved writing and I wanted to be a journalist, which is short-term writing. So I was always into essays rather than, than a long, big, complicated book. And so, um, I started to write essays and and I was surprised how well received they were. Um, Later on, I had to, I had a very good editor who helped me sort of link the essays together. 
and put them in the right order because, you know, I wrote them. Um, in fact, the, the last essay was the absolutely first essay I have ever written. And oh, so, wow. and so in that essay, you actually would, you realize that it was like basically my whole life story. And um, I was lucky to have around a lot of good people who would say to me, um, my, 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 my son married a, a literary professor too. And she was the one who said, you know, you should write short stories and put them all together. And so I started to, 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 as I went along, I should say, I started to think of various happenings in my life. And so I just wrote them without any sort of making it a book. I just, whatever came to me, I wrote on a subject. Um, I wrote funny story during a COVID about how we use toilet paper, how we use uh, newspapers instead of toilet paper because there was always shortages of toilet paper. It's actually kind of funny story, a true story, but it's kind of funny. So, and then Tell I kind us, of definitely. <laughs> Did you read that story yet? I I think I might have glanced over it. So please right. do talk about that. Yeah, it's it. So I, I just feel that it was it. it it, some people may find I was I was feared, and I think that a lot of people felt that it it was kind of a little bit disconnected. But I think that when you read short stories, they don't necessarily have to be. I never understood why a book of short stories should be always like rhythmical and about the same kind of a subject. I always felt it was this was going to be like a imagine a bouquet of wildflowers. Each one is different. And you carry in the bouquet of wildflowers and you see beautiful roses that are absolutely groomed and perfect. And you just stick it in the middle of those flowers. I mean, I think it adds variety. And that's what I felt my book was going to be, you know, wildflowers with few groomed roses and, um, and, a, and, a, and a, I don't know, different add-ons that That's are different. beautiful please do tell the newspaper toilet paper story about because now i'm intrigued <laughs> but, well during covid as you know um there was shortage of everything including toilet paper so one day i was in a in a in a supermarket and they didn't have a toilet paper so i said to my husband you know how we dealt with it at home and he so i explained to him we used to have a toilet paper and we would tear it up and then we would crunch it in our hand to get the ink on our hands. But my father really, really hated the communists. And so he would take out <laughs> a, a, a photographs of like Brezhnev and uh, various uh, and Novotny. And then, and he also, so he used <laughs> the people who he disliked to, um, to use it in, as a, as a toilet paper. So that was <laughs> little revenge for these people that their faces were kissing his behind. <laughs> so, um, yes, it was in Philadelphia so, Journal and they, they thought it was very funny. So, Oh, my goodness. That is hilarious. And I, I bet a lot of people can secretly relate to that, even if they have not done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my husband said, this will block up our... Our pipes. I said, well, we clearly had a white pipes because <laughs> we had all the time. So that was, that was a funny story. That is a funny story. Um, that is funny. I'm wondering, is there another essay in your book that you really want to share that stands out as especially meaningful or important to you funny or serious doesn't matter you know i am very partial to my story about my grandmother who was a real character she was bedridden and she lived with us uh, for 12 years not all of my years i i was born a little later but she would i wrote actually two times about her um but I, I, I put it together in one story. Um, she used to be 
on a bed and my father would sew and um, he would, when <laughs> he hated the communists, like you would not believe. So anytime something happened, if his thread was tearing, he would be cursing and he used to swear. And so he would be cursing all the communists and he would be going on and on and like using everything. So one day my grandmother just started to beat the bed and was using every, and she used to pray. She was a religious woman, of course, and she would like really, really use the worst possible words. So my <laughs> father was absolutely stunned and he goes, what are you doing? And she said, I'm helping you. And he said, how? He said, you know, I'll swear and you sew. And my <laughs> father never ever saw again in front of her. So, and she was a, you know, she, she was a little daredevil. She had a great relationship with my father. And uh, I, I do want to tell you, I, I write about it in my book. Um, I, had a, I was very close to her and I watched her when she died. And, um, and she always used to say to me, don't, don't listen to stupid people. Don't, don't be afraid of stupid people. And when she died, I was in a room. And then I looked up and I saw her coming through the door very vividly. And she looked at me into my eyes and she said, don't fear stupid people. And then she was gone. And I never forgot that. And I, I, it never happened. I had never any other experiences. But I know it wasn't a visage. I was young, but I, till this day, I can bring back that picture. I can see it. And it, it didn't frighten me. You know, of of course, you know, you're speaking to the right person about after death communications. You know, I, I know you listened to my most recent podcast episode about grief and after death communications, and I'm glad you felt comfortable sharing that because, you know, it's, it's far more common than people think to have an experience when someone passes away and, you know, you're awake. It is not a delusion. It is not a hallucination. It is not. Um, it is not a figment of somebody's imagination. Necessarily. You know, could it be sometimes? Sure, but it's so interesting to me because she told you the thing that she felt it was important for you to hear, right. not the typical "I love you" and "I'm fine," which is right. also important. Um, but what she said to you makes it seem to me that it's even more real. Yes. Right. Well, you know, it was it was a communist era and everyone was there was a lot of stupid people around and who tried to frighten people and we lived in that fear. And I think that I I never had anything that happened, but I could visualize it anytime I want. I can just see her, the scarf, the blouse, the long skirt, and um, and, sh and just looking straight in my eyes and telling me that. And it's, you know, when I was in England, when I was alone, and often actually at my worst situations, when I was most frightened, I would close my eyes and I would see that image again. And I wouldn't say that I felt her presence, but I remembered it and I saw it again. I could hear her voice to tell me that. And it always gave me enough strength to carry on. Yeah, it's amazing. Again, it sounds like she said the one thing in the brief moment she had to be able to tell you something that would be the most important for you to hear. Yes. Throughout your life. And your journey has been so remarkable. Um, you know, you are a writer, you have loved writing, but you have obviously done other things. And again, it's like this, it almost seems faded, right? That here you are, you're in England, you are dealing with this incredibly stressful political situation in Czechoslovakia. You are, have all of these things that you can and do worry about. 
but somehow it's you're on this path where you become a, a working model, a successful model. You wind up in a James Bond movie. I yes. mean, how many people can say that? I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that and what that was like for you. Well, yeah, it was kind of a surreal a little bit for me um, because, you know, as I write also, I was always a tomboy. I was I have two older brothers and, you know, I was more suited to kick a can down the road or skate and swim and do whatever I needed to do. Um, so for me to end up being a model was for a little it was quite a lot, and I write about it. It took me a long time to accept, and um, and and at the end of the book, I say I never thought of myself. You know, I never really ex- accepted my own success as a model because, to me, modeling, you know, you're supposed to be famous, or and I never thought of myself as being famous. At, there was a time that people in England, you know, I was in a papers long enough that people may have, but I, I never, I always saw the tomboy rather than the cover of a magazine. And, um, you know, I, I was always very critical of my work. And, um, so it was, it was hard for me, but ultimately when I, when I, then when I started to go into TV, I did the two Ronnie's, I did, Frankie Howard and I was, you know, I mean, in terms of acting, I certainly wasn't um, as successful as I would have liked to be, but it was hard because of my accent, and um, but it was also exciting, and I met incredible people. I I met James Coburn and Sam Pakimpa. I and Roger Moore was absolutely the most kindest person. I mean, he was so nice and um i i met with him again in new york and uh, he 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 remembered the day and we joked and we laughed and he you know i was on a, we've only worked together for one day but we spent actually a lot of time together because i did a lot of um promotion with the other girls we did a lot of promoting the movie even james bond has to get promoted and so <laughs> we traveled around with him and we were, you know, they liked to have him being photographed with us, you know, for, you know, young girls. And so we did a lot of that. And um, so it was a lot of fun. And it, you kind of like, so I remember sitting sometimes and all these photographs like blacking and, you know, shouting and I'm standing there. And I was like, hmm, so this is what fame is like. And although I knew that all of that hoopla was for, for Roger Moore more than for us, but we were part of it. And that was a lot of fun. And that was, maybe then I thought, well, maybe I'm not as much of a tomboy as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw some of the photos. I mean, I, tomboy is probably the last word that I would think of to describe those photos and describe you. I'm very beautiful. Um, and I can only imagine how exciting all of that was. And and again, when you would stop and look back at your journey, I imagine it must have been like, it felt like you yourself were in a movie. Yes, sometimes it did. Sometimes. I remember first time walking on Oxford Street and I saw my cover and I was like, wow. Do you remember which cover? It was, I think, Woman Magazine. I saw it and I was like, I was really surprised. It wasn't the first cover I did, but it was the first time I saw it on Oxford Street in a market, in a, in a shop, and I was like, wow, that's me. <laughs> that's so exciting. So that was fun. It felt good. And then your journey from model and actress and um you know somebody who's experiencing a life that is completely different from what you might have imagined even a few years earlier what's the next significant thing on your journey that you would like to share well the next significant thing was getting married and um then and having having my first son who was born in england and we worked together and in fact uh, we were on a um, mother care uh, book together 
And um, you and your son, me and my son. He was a baby. Oh wow! When he was a tiny baby. Yeah, so that was cute, very sweet, very nice. And uh, in fact, the, the, then after traveling around the world, I been, you know, we lived in Hong Kong, where I also there continued my career um, because I did commercial. When I was in England, we did commercials in Hong Kong, and um, we worked with a modeling agency. And so I contacted them, and then I started to work for them. But then I got pregnant with my second son, and that was the end of that. And then we had a, my husband had a bit of a gypsy fit, so because we went for an, for one year to Boston, then we went for one year to Monte Carlo, then we went back to New Jersey, and so then I oh, had wow. my daughter. And then then I worked with my daughter for a little while, and again in in New York, and um, and I again I did a little bit of modeling in New York, but not much having three children, and um, but then I thought I worked with my little girl, and uh, we did work for a little while. We did some. As uh, uh, magazine, uh, newspaper threads, and but she really wasn't into it. And the, I, we had a couple of bookings, and she just refused to put that clothes on. And I was like, okay, that's it, I'm done. So I stopped. That's when I stopped uh, modeling for good. And, um, and then I went, you know, when the children got, I got busy with the children, and then uh, our neighbor was diagnosed with a brain tumor. and. So I, I organized a golf tournament and, um, with glioblastoma, and he was at Duke, and we raised $2 million for Duke for, for professorship. Wow. And I did a number of, you know, for Jersey Battered Women and for Philharmonic Orchestra in New Jersey. So I got busy, the typical suburban wife, you know, um, working, uh, taking care of kids and doing a lot of uh, events, uh, fundraising. and. Um, so everything, I kind of put myself behind for a little while, like on a shelf. And then when my youngest went to college, uh, we moved to New York. And I start, I got, that's how it happened. I adopted a dog because I always had a dog from shelter. So I adopted the dog, Barney, the cutest dog you have ever seen. He was just the most beautiful little dog. He came from Mississippi in a shelter. And I was looking at him and I was thinking, who would give up this amazing, amazing dog? And I sat there one day, I remember that, and I started to write, creating in my my mind, what could it possibly be? And that's how I started to write stories about Barney. And then I sent it and my children said, you know, these are pretty good. And so my son said to me, if you really want to write, you need to go to school. So I enrolled in school and it just rolled from there. I went from one school to another another school. I went to NYU, um, you know, uh, School of Further Education. And so then I, I was writing for about three years. And then I, I went to Kauai Writers Conference for my birthday. The children sent me. And I met a lot of people. And I was thinking, why don't Everybody was submitting, and I was like, why don't I submit my story? And then I, the first story I submitted got, got accepted, and then it rolled from there. <laughs> that, is, that is amazing. And by the way, I have to tell you, I don't think it's – not that suburban moms don't do all kinds of wonderful things, but it sounds like you – raised money on steroids, uh, as they say, you know, raising $2 million for Duke for your neighbors, you, you know, when he was going through glioblastoma treatment. And that's pretty remarkable. And it sounds like you've really used your, your success and your fame and your platform to, to do good and to be of service. Yeah. And I think your book and your writing is another form of service. I don't know. Well, what do you think? Well, I'd like to think that maybe the book will put a smile on somebody's face who feels sad or somebody who feels, I can't take this anymore, will read my book and say, you know what, it does get better. And in the end, what might be absolutely devastating at a time, it moves, it, it passes. 
And there's a story about that too in my book, but I'm not giving everything away. <laughs> no, of course not. I I want to be mindful of your time, but I want to ask you another question or two. Okay. Just you know, I I wanted to ask you what advice you might have for somebody um, who is starting over in a new country for facing adversity. Well, if you are in a country in a new country, I would say the first thing learn to speak the language. It's very, very important. I really didn't sleep. I just, it's most important because when you cannot communicate, you feel so powerless. You feel so diminished. I cried myself to sleep the first few weeks when I couldn't express myself. I was trying to say something and you, I can't, I find it personally, I find it incredibly frustrating and 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 uh, painful and so i would say to everybody first learn to speak the language and then learn as much as you possibly can about your new country and try to to understand and try to to learn i think that the learning and try to give back try to to give other people who are coming in like there are people always coming in and um you know i would always have lots of slovaks and czechs and we would be you know sometimes i would come in i would just count the shoes and to see how many <laughs> were in my apartment on that particular night it's important to to share your good fortune and to learn and to try and Keep you know you ha it's important to keep your own identity. I think people would never you know mistaken me for the you know when I was in England for a British person they would never mistaken me. But it's I think it's important to to learn. I it's just I can't stress it enough to learn about others because you you understand other people when you learn about them then you understand. Even when they sometimes can be a little uh, stroppy, you understand why. And that's important. And then you don't feel angry. You don't feel hurt. You don't feel slighted. You just feel, you know, I understand. It sounds like that's important advice, actually, also for people who maybe don't know immigrants in their area personally or have some I'm going to say work to do in terms of understanding experiences of people whose situations and cultures are different from their own um yes yes I mean more the merrier that you learn you know if if we had only one one set of cakes we'll get bored with them you know, I compare it like, can you imagine wedding with only one dessert? <laughs> How boring would that be? 100%. Monica, is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have or anything that you wanted to share that we haven't yet covered? Um. I think we covered pretty much everything. I guess I would just say never give up. Always believe. And don't, I think people should not think just because they didn't reach the top of the ladder that they are not successful. As long as you climbed as far as you could and you are able to, you have reached your success. And I'm saying this because that's what I had personally problems. I never thought I've done enough because I didn't get to the top. And that's wrong. You know, there's far more people in the middle than they are on the top. And it's allowed you to have a beautiful journey experiencing so many things and sharing other gifts of yours like your writing yes yes i love to write 
my beautiful Bocha Shani. Del Vivo. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, so, Annika, where can people learn more about your work? And where can they purchase um, Encounter with the Future? Is it, well, it is out? I, I know I have the PDF, but the book out is out. And it, okay. you, they can get it if you go to www.anikapavel.com. They, you, it brings you straight away to encounter with the future, and there is, you just, it, there is also a line order here, and you can press it, and it brings you straight to the Amazon. Or Perfect. if you want to, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, but it's easier to get it on Amazon. But it's on my website, so www.anikapavel.com. And I'll put that link in the show notes as well. Okay. So. Annika Pavel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit, to meet you and to hear about your incredible journey. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. This has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you enjoyed the show, please do remember to like, share, and follow. It helps me to continue bringing more great content to you. And as always, until next time. Be well.